a good boy, a bad boss, and growing to the next level. All this and more in this episode of the podcast. Hey, what's going on? This is David Pasqualone, and welcome to Hanging Out with David Pasqualone and Friends. Today, our special guest is Blair Aby. Blair is going to talk to us today about his journey from being a good boy to having a bad boss to learning to grow through it all and become a better man. He talks about how he went in his journey through school, starting off in pre-med, then switching his major, switching his career, switching his career again, and how what seemed devastating, he whistle blew, did the right thing, and he was punished for it. So he's going to talk about his journey and how he overcame all this and so much more. We talk about religion. We talk about reincarnation. We talk about a bunch of steps and things within and without a Christianity. And we also talk about how there's a commonality, but there's only one truth. So as you listen to this episode, listen all the way through. There's a bunch of gold nuggets along the way. When you get to the end, our friend Blair leaves us a special offer for our hanging out audience. So thank you, Blair. And at this time, please like the podcast. If you can't give us a five-star review, go to my website, davidpasqualone.com. Shoot us a message through the contact us page and tell me why. If not, share with your friends, family, subscribe, like it. You know what to do. We love you. We want to grow. And we seriously don't want to grow to be famous. We want to grow to reach more people so everybody can have a better life. God is glorified and we all thrive together. So at this time, Let's hang out with our friend, Blair Aby. Hey, Blair, how are you today? Good morning, Dave. Happy to be here. I've been looking forward to our uh, conversation. Oh, me as well. Me as well. And I just told our listeners a little bit about you. They are pumped to hear your episode and what you have to offer. Before we begin, though, our listeners, whether they're first time or whether they've been with us since day one, three years ago, they know that we're going to go through the past, the present, and the future, your origin story, you know, what your upbringing was like, the good, the bad, and the ugly all along the way of what created you and the yeah. man you are today. And then we'll transition to where you are today and where you're headed. So after you help us, we can help you get there. Okay, cool. But be- before we jump in, for the listeners, this is a long format podcast. You're going to drop nuggets of gold all along the way that if they listen, they're going to be able to take and apply to their lives and be better people. But if there was one message that you're going to deliver today, one truth you're going to be able to say confidently, if you listen to this episode, this is what you're going to get, what would that message be? I think my fundamental message, and I'm an author, I've got five books on meditation, is that you, me, we are all eternal beings in addition to being human beings and that meditation is the most direct path to experiencing that and to coming to know the bigger part of who you and I and we are. Okay. So that is the main topic that you're going to get today, ladies and gentlemen, But we're also going to hear Blair's story of what brought him to this point in life, that that's what he's passionate about. That's what the message is. So stand by. So Blair, at this time, what was your upbringing like, your family, your, you know, any siblings? Where'd you grow up? Tell us about the the core foundation. I grew up in North Carolina. I live in California now. I grew up in a family of five kids. My father was an architect. And I think fundamentally, I had a a, a, a good upbringing. Uh, my parents um, liked each other. Uh, they liked me. Uh, I was the oldest. And uh, along the way, I, I played high school and college sports. I went to a college, a little college in North Carolina, actually a Davidson College where Steph Curry went. And so my, my, I would say my early upbringing was 
uh, it wasn't exactly leave it to beaver, but it was in that ballpark of uh, fairly normal childhood without too many traumas. Of course, we all get traumatized to some degree or another by childhood, but uh, not like some of the uh, stories that I've heard from friends. Yeah. So what you're basically saying is growing up, you know, you had ups and downs, but there was no significant mark that you're like, this changed the course of my life, or I really struggled with this for years. It was pretty much steady growth as what we'd consider a quote unquote normal, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. So then as you're growing up and as you're in school, you said you're athletic and you're playing sports, what was your mindset back then? And as you grow up, did it change or just get stronger? Well, I, I was a good boy. <laughs> my, you know, I, 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 I was, I was able to please my parents. Um, I did well in school. Uh, I did well in playing sports. And so I, I would say I was an achiever, a striver, and I, I wanted to always do well had high aspirations for myself. And, you know, that, that continued through, throughout most of my life and was, has been part of what I would call a successful life, if you will. Uh, We'll talk about a, a 90 degree turn that happened in recent years that has really changed how I view myself and, and, and what I'm doing these days. But my career uh, path was along being entrepreneurial, then working as a consultant for the Small Business Development Center, uh, which is all over the country as a business consultant. And my, my career doing that spanned about 25 years. Okay. And then let's back up a little bit then. Sure. So you're growing up, childhood's kind of normal. You go into college. When you're in college, yes. was your was your major business? Did you stumble upon that? Where did your life go at that point? Yes. And, and did we miss anything between birth and college before we jump in? Not really. Not anything that I would call significant. So... I entered college with the expectation of going through a pre-med and, and becoming a doctor. Organic chemistry kicked my tush, and I did not complete that and instead shifted over to political science, which was the easiest way to finish up. I went to an all-boys school, uh, partially because of a, of a football scholarship, and it really wasn't and I look back on it, it was just I, there was just, I was sleepy at the time, I guess. I didn't realize there weren't any girls there. And it was something of a shock. And from that perspective, it was kind of lonely for that four year period of time. So that when I left college and headed for San Francisco and and the, the bright lights of the big city, that was a cultural change, but one that I welcomed having spent a fairly quiet four-year period of time in college. And when you went to San Francisco, what yes. was the motivating factor that brought you out there? Like, what I, was the allure? I understand. My friend and I, at the end of college, went to Maine for the summer. He got a job as a lifeguard. I got, guard. I got a job with a, an electrician because I had a little bit of experience at doing that. Um, and at the end of the summer, uh, I introduced him to a young lady that I happened to meet uh, in the little town that we were located in. Um, and everybody began to scatter going back to uh, their homes. Well, she went back to came back to California. And he said, what, um, why don't we go to California? Because he was very interested in her. So I said, OK, let's go. I had a half a Camaro to move in to California. And so we headed off for for California. I I, I was definitely looking for for something different from anything I'd done previously. So that was a big jump for me. And of course, as you can imagine, from small town North Carolina to big city San Francisco, 
uh, a huge culture change, change um, a bit, bit of a culture shock. And we got a little apartment in, in downtown San Francisco, and I began looking for work. That really turned up nothing much because with a degree in political science, you know, I was looking for a white collar job of some sort. Well, in San Francisco, everybody, you know, is it's very competitive. So I ended up falling back on my construction experience and began doing remodeling of old Victorian houses as a way to be able to stay in San Francisco and not have to go back to North Carolina with my tail tucked between my legs. Uh, and then that's what I did for oh, four or five years before I went back to school and got a, a degree, advanced degree, a master's degree to uh, in, in public administration and started working for the state of California at that point. So you're going from pre-law to political science to construction, and now you're continuing to grow, to yes. continue to, to educate yourself and to try new things. So where does your life go from there? I worked for the state of California for about um, almost five years and then started a business with a couple of other guys in Berkeley. Uh, the name of the business was the Owner Builder Center. And what we did was to teach people how to build and remodel their own homes. So we had classes and workshops and seminars and um, architectural services and finance services and just a whole bunch of things that we could offer to the public, including a summer program where people came from all over the country uh, to a rural site where they got a chance to learn uh, construction um, uh, knowledge and actually work on a house that was under construction. So it was a little bit like, like Tom Sawyer in a way, <laughs> um, in that uh, it was people working on somebody's house and we got paid to work on that person's house and people paid us to uh, learn. And it was it was really a, the first time I had any national exposure. We got, we got some publicity through Time Magazine, for example, for the program and other major media outlets. And it became, you know, quite something there for a while. That's awesome. And then as you're doing this, you said you had two partners. Yes. Are you still single at this point? Did you meet your wife yes. yet? Okay. I met my wife during that time. It was, gosh, it was eight years before we ended up getting married. She was married at the time that I met her. And we had a somewhat tumultuous relationship there for about an eight-year period of time, partially because it was, I had a hard time committing. She had a child. It was, you know what I found out uh, as a result of my resistance to uh, committing to that relationship was that the, the, the difficulty of committing was really, I didn't trust myself. I, I would say one of the things about my upbringing was that my relationship with my mother was close. In fact, in some ways, a little bit too close. And so there was a degree of, I don't know, mistrust of women, if you will. And that took a while to get over. But once we decided to get married, you know, that all of that disappeared. We had a child within about a year and he is now 42 years old. Beautiful. So let's use that as one of our first talking points for okay. people with commitment issues, especially, you know, it used to be the joke men had commitment issues. Now yes. women are just as messed up, right? So for people with commitment issues, what kind of advice do you give them to resolve this and move forward in life? Yes. I, I think what I would say about that is that Commitment issues are internal, that it's useful and valuable to examine what that's about. So among the things that, that I did was some delving into uh, uh, personal development and workshops and seminars and so forth where 
I really got a chance to examine what that was all about. And eventually the light bulb went off and I realized that the problem was me, not her. And that um, that's a sort of cleared the way, if you will, for us to proceed. Excellent. What was some of the things you did? So people are listening and they're used to the show. Yes. Not just what you achieved or overcame, but the practical steps of how you did it. So do you Understand. remember any of the steps you took of the self-growth, not just self-growth? Was there a book you read that stood out? Was there a program you went to? Was there questions you asked yourself? Was there anything that got you to that point that you can yeah. remember? Yes, I understand. And this goes along with my interest in spirituality and and and, and all of that. My first introduction into spirituality was a union dream workshop at the Jewish Community Center down in in, in downtown San Francisco. Um, and that was really part of my awakening. Uh, I began to see that there was more to life and and more to being human uh, than um, the somewhat limited uh, upbringing that I had. I also then began doing yoga um, and meditation at that time. Uh, and that was uh, an, an additional step in in my awakening to be exposed to a different religion to be exposed to a different view of spirituality, to be able to, to delve into myself from a meditative perspective, which, as I said, I think is the most direct route to waking up and, and growing up. Um, I also, uh, there was a program called the uh, Earhart Seminar Training, EST, um, and my wife and I, uh, at the time, uh, were both involved in that. And that was uh, a, a deep dive into spirituality and to self-examination. And then they had workshops and seminars after that. So I took advantage of, of those uh, opportunities as well. And that really propelled me forward in terms of my spiritual growth and evolution. All right. So now you're making progress personally. You've met your wife. You're deciding to commit. And then your business, you're working with two partners and everything seems to be going well. Where does life go from there that got you from that being an entrepreneur to working at the Small Business Development Center? Yes. The the the, the business that I was doing did okay, but I would say that it wasn't it, it wasn't a overwhelming success financially, certainly. And so we struggled. We struggled like a lot of young couples to just make ends meet and to keep the bills paid and so on and so forth. And ultimately, what we decided to do was to move back to North Carolina because there was an opportunity there to buy a house, which we had not been able to do in the San Francisco area. And it was at the point where we moved back, the, the, our son, our dog, our cat, Lynn and I in a Dodge Caravan moving back to North Carolina <laughs> and basically starting over. It was that at that point that I found an opportunity to do small business development center work and to do business consulting. And that really has was was my career trajectory, if you will, um, in working first with clients then uh, moving up to being a, a leader, a team leader, and a regional director, and all the way to the point where we moved back to California, where I took a job in San Diego as an assistant state director of the program that was in that's in Southern California. Wow, beautiful places you've lived. North Carolina, yes, San Diego, absolutely. Yeah. San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, you got Tried to keep that going. <laughs> you, yes, there's beautiful places all over the U.S., but you had a, a, quite a few of them. Yes. So now you're there. Yes. And you're back in California, you're in San Diego. Yes. And what are you learning? What are you What are you right. achieving and growing as your your life moves forward? Yes. Well, unfortunately, that turned out to be professional hell. Hmm. My boss was, I'd never had a bad boss. This lady was terrible. She was, uh, 
somewhat psychopathic, really. She was abusing employees. She was misusing funds. And she was basically running the program into the ground. The people who were supposed to be monitoring her, however, weren't doing their job. And she was a real smoke and mirrors kind of person. It was just a lot of um, uh, uh, inability of the people who were supposed to be uh, watching over the program to see what was going on. And eventually, I just couldn't put up with it anymore. And in about a year after I, I got there, I decided to go to the authorities and to let them know what was going on, whistleblowing, if you will. Now, that's that a would, great that's a great fork in the road, right? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it's like a flip of the coin. That's when right. you whistleblow, you're either a hero or you're tormented. Which way did they go with you? A An investigation was done. She was fired. But... I was fired also, which often happens to whistleblowers. They said I was a troublemaker. The trouble that I made was actually exposing their incompetence in monitoring the program and making sure that it was going well. And so it was it was at a community college down in, in uh, San Diego. Uh, and, and they were quite embarrassed about all of this. Uh, it, there was a, a, a bit of a hullabaloo about it. Uh, and um, they decided that that I was expendable as well. Uh, so that that really ended a 25 year trajectory uh, where I expected to be a, a state director uh, of the and, program and, somewhere. And that makes you feel great, right? Just wake up the next morning, energized, oh, easy man. to recover I mean, from. That that was that was terrible. I mean, it was <laughs> it was it was a personal and professional disaster because. Not only did I lose my income and my high level position and was really a blow to my ego, it, it, it really turned my life upside down. Fortunately, I had some resources, so I didn't have to go back to work right away, but I was new to San Diego and, and it was hard to find something to do that I really wanted to do. But during that time, I took a deep dive into my meditation uh, practice. And that was really the turning point for me for where I am now and what I'm doing now in that in taking that deep dive, I began to write a journal for therapy. It was a good therapeutic process. And after about 150,000 words or so of journaling night after night after night, I began to realize that I had material for a book or two. And it was at that point I began to assemble that material into, into books, which has turned out to be six books now, some six years later. Um, we decided to move back to the Bay Area where my son was and be back in the San Francisco area instead of staying in San Diego. All of that turned out to be the best possible outcome for a very personally devastating outcome of that job in San Diego. It was as if soul or spirit was saying to me, it's time to end what you've been doing. It's time for you to do something else. And it was really at that point that I began to get a sense of making soul contact or contact with my higher self. I think we all have a soul. We all have a higher self, but very few of us in, in a human lifetime actually make contact with that part of ourselves in a way where a relationship with soul is developed and where significant increase in uh, personal growth and evolution occurs. So that's you know one of the things that I talk a lot about in my books and in and, and my classes and with my uh, clients and so forth is making soul contact, how to do that, and the value of that, and um, the achievement really that that is. 
And then when you're working with your clients now, you have the experiences that you went from an entrepreneur to a business consultant to an author, yes. and now you're helping people again. Yes. Who is the ideal, and I don't want to say ideal client like that you target, but right. for the people listening, who are the people you can help best? Like, who are the people you're like, you know, I can bring value to almost anybody, but these are the yes. people I can really help. I understand. I think the people that I can help the best are those who have are already on a spiritual path, but maybe have gotten stalled out um, with that, are feeling like they need something else in order to grow to their next level. And who, who can see the value of of working with somebody in order to accelerate that growth. Okay. And then what are some of the things you do when you're working with a client? Yes. So if somebody calls you up, Blair, what will they expect? Like what's some of the things I know every program is going to be custom and different, Sure. but what are some of the things they can expect? And then maybe right. let's even get into what's something they can start off and try at home. Yes. I think the first thing that happens is I just talk to people about where they are uh, and what their goals are, especially as it relates to their spiritual growth, to just get a sense of, um, you know, how far are they along the path and how I can be helpful in accelerating that growth uh, on their path. Um, typically, uh, that um, includes working with people and 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 t and and offering some tools that I offer in my books that I offer in my podcast conversations and and in my blog posts and so on and so forth tools to accelerate their meditation process and to help them grow and evolve as people so I've developed some of my own meditation tools, and I'll be happy to share that with you. I've developed some meditation tools that I think work better than the typical meditation training programs that are out there. Most meditation training programs are about mind training, teaching your teaching yourself to calm down, teaching yourself, or, or, or working with your mind in order to get your mind, in order to quieten your mind. And that's really difficult. I mean, I practiced that kind of mind training for years and found that the process that I developed is really much better and is a much more direct route to higher consciousness and to making soul contact. The, the process that I have for doing that is is fairly simple and fairly straightforward, but but it's turned out to be really powerful for people. So that's one of the things that I share with with my clients is 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 that meditation process and the use of that meditation process in order to uh, accelerate their uh, spiritual growth. Yeah, is that something you can share with us today? Sure. So it's simple. It's straightforward. It's called higher consciousness meditation. And it begins by, I'll just take you through it, by, by taking a deep breath and saying to yourself, peace, be still. A very powerful statement of uh, mindfulness that you can use at any time, anywhere to just calm yourself down. Just say, peace, be still. And then take another deep breath. It, this process has five steps. The first step is to make an open-ended statement, the all is. Now, I like using the all because it's an alternative to God, which has so many different connotations to so many people. But you can also say God is or higher consciousness is and have it be an open-ended statement and have spirit or the all respond to you offering you 
insight into what the all is. And that could be the all is omnipresent, for example. And you get a sense of omnipresence and what that's about. Or the response could be that the the all is that, that I'm a piece of the all. So that the all and I are one. It's interesting. Everybody has, you know, different responses to that because everybody has their own process. But opening oneself up to allowing God, spirit, the all into your consciousness is the first step. The next step is to say higher consciousness or soul is and having it be an open-ended statement so that your soul can respond. Because your soul, your higher consciousness, your higher self wants to be part of your life. Um, in some cases, it's waited, I think, lifetimes to be able to enter into the uh, uh, direct relationship with its human um, uh, counterpart. And so the response might be to higher consciousness is or soul is a, a life companion, or it could be that the response is uh, soul has been waiting to uh, become part of my life, or or soul is 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 that greater part of myself mm. that is higher consciousness or that is eternal beingness. The third step is to say, I am an eternal being. So it's a, it's a statement of who we are, I am, as an alter alternative or a, 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 a different, different version of my human self. And then the last step is one of repeating several times a, a, a little mindfulness exercise, which is illuminate, elevate, radiate. So th this whole process is intended to have an experience of illumination and will have an experience of illumination. If you do it 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 times, it sometimes takes a while for... To, to, to let this begin to work. But if you marinate in it for a while, it begins to work and the contact with higher self begins to happen, contact with soul begins to happen. And then after doing the uh, illuminate, elevate, radiate light into my world, um, then for however much time you have at, at the end of all of that, to just sit and be with it for a while and to have the experience of illumination. So that's what the process is like. Everybody has their own reaction to it. Not It's not for everybody, but it is for those people who may want a, like I said, a, a more direct route to uh, illumination or to higher consciousness. And then what would people, when you say higher consciousness and illumination, yes. Yes. What are define that and what what should mm -hmm. people expect? Like what is illumination? What is a higher consciousness? Right. Well, again, I think we all are eternal beings in a very limited biomechanical vehicle with an onboard computer, our minds, that controls the onboard vehicle. So because we're all limited in that way, and we've been limited that way, we've been taught that that's really who we are as human beings, dog eat dog. It's a tough world out there. And you have to you have to strive and scrap in order to 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 make uh, good um, to have a good life. None of us are offered an alternative way of thinking about that. But our master teachers, from Jesus to Buddha to Lao Tzu and the, the, the Hindu, Hindu folks, all of them sit, said, 
in one way or another that the kingdom of God, spirit, lies within you. And that's where you look for illumination or that's where you look for spiritual growth or that's where you look for development of your higher consciousness. They were all, I think, pointing in that direction with their teachings. Unfortunately, their teachings end up getting turned into religions and dogma and people put them up on a pedestal that's that that's out of reach uh, instead of realizing that their spiritual teacher, whoever their spiritual te teacher happens to be, is, is merely somebody a little further down the path who's turning around and saying, here's the way to go. Here's the direction that that you want to go in. And that is to find that higher self, to find that heaven within or spirit within, to find that part of who you are in this lifetime and to transcend or to add that to your human consciousness. So what do you think when this world is over, when this life is over, what, what yes. do you believe is beyond? Like I your think, beliefs, not you're right or I'm right. Yes, no, <laughs> I, I understand. Live, no, I, understand. I live by a biblical worldview and most of yes. our listeners do, but we have yes. a heavy listenership in the Middle East, Australia, right. all yeah. over the world, thankfully. But yes. what is your belief system that like when we die, we close our eyes here, we open our eyes, or we never open our eyes, what happens? Yes. My my belief and my experience is based on my delving down into all of this um, spirituality that I've done for the last six or eight years. My, my, my really strong sense is that we take our last breath on this side, and then we take our next breath on the other side, which I like to call fifth dimensional reality, three dimensional reality here. Einstein said four dimensional reality includes time. Fifth dimensional reality is the reality of spirit. So I think what happens is that we then go off on the next adventure that we're going to have, whatever that happens to be, after taking that next breath into the other side. I've had experiences. I had experience. I probably have, a, I don't know, six or eight experiences. I think, think a lot of people have this similar experience of having contact with my father and with my mother after they died. So that solidified a little bit the notion that this isn't the only uh, experience that I'm going to have, but that this is an ongoing and evolving experience. I personally believe in reincarnation. I personally believe that I've been here many times. I personally believe that I chose my parents for um, some specific reasons prior to taking a deep, you know, taking a dive in, into three-dimensional reality and jumping out of five-dimensional reality into three-dimensional reality, living this life, that I'll go from this life into the next adventure, and that there's every possibility I'm going to be coming back. Okay. Now, if someone was trying to... Actually, let's finish. Where are you today? Yes. And where are you heading, Blair? And then let's get into if someone wants to contact you, What's the best way for them to reach you? Do you have any special offers for them? Yes. So I've at this point, I've written five books. Four of them on are on meditation. One is on manifestation, um, spiritual manifestation. My next book, which I'm working on, is on health and wellness. And all of this is from a spiritual perspective, and it's from the particular perspective that, that we've been talking about for the last little bit. Um, I anticipate writing at least another three or four books. I've started doing podcasts. I think perhaps doing public speaking is in my future. But I will continue to do the work that I do in in writing books. And I just passed 25,000 sales or giveaways of my books this hey past congrats week. that's a big yeah. milestone it is what i'd like to do this year is 
give away as many as 50,000 books, just, you know, giving them away. And one of the books that I have for your readers is my mindfulness book, which can be obtained by going to my website or, you know, just typing in a URL and getting a free copy of that book. And what's your website for the listeners? We'll put a link in the show notes. But for those who are typing it in now, what's your website? Okay. So the website is highcmeditation.com. That's H-I capital C as the music high C, but higher consciousness, higher consciousness, highcmeditation.com. And that'll take them right to my website and it'll take them to the link to getting uh, a copy of the mindfulness book. I'll put them on my email list. I'll be sending them a blog twice a month. And there'll be other things that, you know, that are available to folks who uh, are interested in this sort of thing. Beautiful, beautiful. All right. Well, let me ask you another question then, Blair. Sure. Is there anything else we missed in your life from birth to today that we haven't discussed that you want to talk about? And also, is there a final message you want to leave with our listeners? So if they're like the last thing they do and they're hearing your voice and you want them to consider one more thing, is there anything that you want to say? Yes. Well, I I think uh, I mentioned... Let me let me if if I think we have time. Let me share a manifestation tool that I use that works really well. It's called the higher. It's called the best possible outcome a manifestation tool, and it's one that basically turns over the unfolding of a particular desire to spirit or to higher consciousness or to soul, uh, and it it starts by again peace be still. And then uh, proceeds to, I ask for the best possible outcome of the podcast with Dave today, which is what I did just before I got started with you. Or I ask for the best possible outcome for a parking place at the restaurant that I'm going to. I mean, you can use it for anything, but I ask for the best possible outcome. Pause, take a breath. Get a sense that your higher consciousness has been engaged and then offer thanks for higher consciousness being involved in your life. Now, that process is very important in that it's an ask. It's an ask for the best possible outcome, but it's not a dictation from the human mind of what should be the outcome. It's off or it's letting spirit unfold it for you. It's letting spirit be engaged in your life. And often the outcome is a better outcome that I might have in mind in my human desires, but instead um, leaves it to, to spirit for the best possible outcome. And then a thank you for spirit's engagement, if you will. So, it, it's a it's a process that is in my uh, my book called the the manifestation book, but it's a really simple, straightforward, very powerful process for manifesting or creating your life the way you want it to be. And I think we all create our own reality. So this is a way to help you create your own reality. Yeah, and so I really appreciate you and the time we spent together today, Blair. And I have a question, if you don't mind, about reincarnation, because I grew up in a home, you know, Italian-American. So we grew up pretty much Catholic, you know what you'd say. And then I got saved when I was a teenager. So that just means I trusted Christ as my savior personally, you know, for whosoever shall call upon you, Lord shall be saved. And since then, I'm straightforward. I've just read my Bible and I've gone to church in uh, typically a Baptist church in my circle, you know, what I find is most accurate to the Bible today. Yes. And then I'm, as I'm learning and growing, 
a lot of the stuff you're saying, you know, you might phrase it different than me, but it's, it's the same. Like, you know, it is. peace yeah. be still, that's a quote from Jesus, right? And the then you're, <laughs> the, the, the steps you're going through, you know, asking you shall receive. There's so many Ask. biblical similarities, yes. yes. but one thing that, you know, a lot of people, you got to trust Christ and you got to, you know, put your faith in him is what, like the, what I think the Bible says for eternity. But I always thought about reincarnation. I've never fully understood it. So if you don't mind yes. humoring me sure. in your belief system, right. You know, it seems like, and I'm not, I'm not making fun of you, but you know I what I mean? I understand. If you no, take no. Christians, hey, if you I, take I grew people, up in a Lutheran church, I know exactly what you're yeah, talking about. But it doesn't yeah, matter. Sure. It doesn't matter what religion you are. It comes down yes. to your relationship with God. Right. But when it comes to people of any belief system, you always have yes. the nuts, right? right. Yes. So every time I talk about, you know, I'm being blunt. Every time I hear somebody say they believe in reincarnation, you know, yes. it's a lady like I used to be Joan of Arc. I used to be Cleopatra. Right, it's like, right. listen, not everybody can be Joan of Arc or Cleopatra. <laughs> There's only one, right? Right, right, right. So my question was always, if you're being reincarnated, yes. how come we don't remember it? Because if we're supposed to be learning and growing and I guess trying to get it right to get to that ultimate level, yes. how come we don't remember our past lives? Right. Um, well, I think, first of all, it'd be too confusing. It would be an overwhelm to to remember our past lives. I, th I think when we, when, we, when we jump into three-dimensional reality, basically we three-dimensional reality is set up so that you don't remember. And nobody, when you get here, offers any alternative way of thinking about it. So nobody's really offering an alternative to three-dimensional reality, to human consciousness, and so forth. It's all set up, it seems, to, 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 to learn lessons over and over again, and to grow and to evolve and that this is said to be one of the most attractive places to come in the universe because you accelerate your growth potentially your spiritual growth in a very difficult situation so it's like the growth that you get from being in any any difficult situation so it's it's a, it's a place that lots of people want to come and, and obviously eight billion now are here But most of us don't wake up in a lifetime. Most of us don't, because we're not exposed to the kind of information that you and I are talking about today. We're not exposed to what Jesus was really saying, which is the kingdom of heaven is within you. That you have the ability to be, to have an experience of Christ consciousness also the way Jesus had an experience of Christ consciousness, because Christ is a term for anybody, according to my research, of anybody of any religion who re who achieves a certain state of awareness or of illumination. So it's Jesus Christ, Blair Christ, Steve Christ, Dave Christ. All of us have that potential within us. And each of our master teachers essentially said that in one way or another. They all said the same thing. You have the potential for waking up the same way I woke up. Yeah. And see, my understanding is slightly mm -hmm. different. Like this is actually, we're recording for people who don't know, you know, it's just the Passover and we're heading into what people popularly call Easter weekend or resurrection yes. Sunday. Right. And the Christ to me has always been how I understood is like the savior. Like he was yes. the son of God born to man, you know, all God, all man, but he chose and allowed himself to die for us for his sacrifice. So yeah, it's just so much to think about. And I was just, I did want to know, cause I never fully understood. I've met people who believe in reincarnation, but I never had this great opportunity to sit here and talk and ask questions. Yeah. So, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners have that too. And then, you know, but again, biblically we're born. You said that, you know, I agree with it. We die. Nobody can argue that. Right. John, right. John Adams and all the founding fathers said, the only thing certain is death and taxes, right? So I think we're all on the same page. And then you believe in a something after this life. I do too. The Bible says, you know, absent from the body, present with the Lord. There's a point yes. unto man wants to die, then the judgment. So then that's where I think our belief systems 
change a little bit where to me it's like our life ends here and there is an attorney this is just a short you know average 70 to 80 year test yes and then we go into eternity but then based on our life on earth and what we believed in right. that drastically changes our eternity yeah. and what you're saying is you believe that once you're in eternity you just start another growth cycle or how would you explain it i don't want to misspeak that's correct. I, I think you, 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 you're there, you have whatever experiences you have over there, whatever healing that you need to do over there, and that you then begin to plan your return to, to Earth for your next adventure. And then you, you live, you die, you uh, go back to five-dimensional reality, you have what... So, I mean, none of us really knows. Everybody has beliefs. They even have some experiences that says, well, yeah, this seems to be true. Mm -hmm. That's what my experiences are, is that it seems that uh, reincarnation is true. But I also think that there are times when people um, grow sufficiently that when they leave this life, they don't come back because there's no need to come back. They've learned the lessons that there are to learn from being a human being on three in three-dimensional reality. And then where do they go from there? Like once that lesson's learned, where where's the? I, I, I'm not sure, but I think everybody has their own adventure, and they make their own choices from five dimensional from five dimensional perspective as to what experience they need and want to have next in order for them to, to continue to grow and evolve. As to what that is, you know, I don't. It has to be different for every person, but specifically, I don't know. Okay, that's. And in that's, fact, I don't know what my I don't know what my mine's going to be. You know, I think it's going to be fabulous, <laughs> but you know, specifically what it is, I, I'm not, I don't know. Yeah, man, I don't know. This is the only life I remember, <laughs> and I thank no. God for it. But there's been a lot of harsh, hard times, and I don't want to go through this again. I just want to be at peace with the Lord forever. I don't, I don't really, I don't want to go through the journey again. Well, but I, that, not that I'm like suicidal. Not that I'm not. I, no, no, I understand. No, I understand. All I'm saying is have that experience here now. Yeah. Don't wait till you get over to the other side. Have it here because it's possible. It's possible to have that experience of illumination while you're in three dimensional reality. It's possible to be five dimensional at the same time you're in three dimensional, uh, in a three dimensional body. Hmm? And I think that, and the last thing I would say is that I think meditation is the direct, the most direct path. To having that experience if it's something that you're interested in yeah and if someone wants to get in touch with you again the yes. website's the best way to reach out is that correct blair that would be correct okay awesome well listen it's been great hanging out with you today it's been a pleasure thank you so much for your time and your the knowledge and life you've shared with us yes any final thoughts before we part to the listeners well i would sort of end by saying namaste which you've probably heard that means the spirit within me acknowledges the spirit within you. The higher consciousness within me acknowledges the higher consciousness within you. And I would say that to you, and I would say that to all your listeners. Namaste. Well, thank you, my friend. I appreciate you very much, Blair. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd enjoy this episode, if you want to continue the conversation, you know, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, our podcast, through Apple, Spotify, or whatever you're using like it, share it, give us a five-star rating. If you can't, shoot me an email, why, through my website, davidpascalone.com. Be like you're ugly, you get a big nose, you're too boring, whatever it is. <laughs> Let us know how we can make the podcast better so Blair and other guests get better exposure. But it's not about growing the podcast or pumping our guests. It's about helping you. It's about helping you grow and bringing you great content and so the world's just a better place. It really is about glorifying God and helping people grow. So thanks for being here today. Blair, thank you for being here today. Appreciate it, brother. Absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for the invitation. Yes, yes. And ladies and gentlemen, we'll see you in the next episode. Ciao.